crazy down bad what they had didn't last Whoa. all right welcome back to cs196 everyone let's go ahead and get everything started so as always uh per feedback in case you guys haven't heard about why twitch chat is turned off just Write your questions and comments in the Discord. We have lecture questions for any questions that you guys might have throughout the lecture, and Twitch chat for those of you who just want to chat throughout the stream. So today we have our uh, first lecture on some topics that are going to be a little bit unrelated to what we've been doing so far. So over the next maybe two weeks or so, we're going to be go we're going to be going over a a handful of topics that are not always directly connected to each other, but all of these topics that we're going to go through over the next two weeks are either going to be very helpful for you just normally with programming, or it might just be something that is helpful for you directly in your projects. So today, we're going to be talking about tips and tricks for debugging and uh, some more topics that you can see over the cr next two weeks are going to be including things like machine learning, uh, regular expressions, we'll have a lecture on how to build a Flask, Flask server, things of these sorts. So. Uh, that's a little bit of a heads up of what it's going to look like over the next couple of uh, next lectures. But today, we're going to be covering tips and tricks for debugging. So I wanted to start off with this photo here uh, with this debugging lecture because I think it kind of shows very well how you can describe debugging. Uh, debugging, being skilled at it is, is how you can kind of relate here where you, you're able to sit in a, a room full of fire and just be able to say this is fine. Just calmly you know, go through the issues, don't panic, just put out the fire, and eventually you'll get through it. Um, and so one of the reasons why we are having this lecture is because one of the main goals of this course is to help you guys become self-sufficient programmers. And we haven't really focused on this too much until now. Uh, a good programmer is one that is as self-sufficient as possible. And so what does that mean? Well, we want you guys to be able to work through issues uh, on your own as much as possible. Of course, you're always allowed to ask for help um, when you when you really need it, but we want to be able to help you guys be as self-sufficient as possible. And so one of the ways to become a self-sufficient programmer is to know how to properly debug your code and whatever issues that you might have. And I put this quote up here because, uh, you know, debugging is something that everyone has to deal with. It's not like something that only beginners to coding have to deal with. It's not really a topic that, you know, after coding for 30 years, you, you'll never have to debug again or something. Debugging never goes away. Everyone hates it. And here's a quote to prove that. So this is a, a quote that I found on the UIUC subreddit like, a, a, you know, a semester ago. Uh, this is a, from a professor that we have at the school, uh, Professor Wade Fagan. He's a, he's a very good professor. He teaches... Um, he used to teach CS225, but now he's on to some other courses. But extremely intelligent guy. Um, very, very strong in computer science, obviously. Dude's got like a PhD. Um, very good programmer. Very, very well educated with computer science and a great teacher. And he says this on, on the subreddit. So he says, debugging sucks. I hate it. Tools, IDEs, debuggers, etc. make it easier. But it still sucks. Finding a bug can take hours just to fix one line of code. I try everything I can to avoid needing to debug. So this is just a nice little overarching quote basically saying no matter who you are, you will eventually have to debug and you're going to want to rip your hair out. It's just a part of the process of software engineering, computer science, programming, whatever it is. So today we're going to go through some tips and tricks. But at first, I want to touch on this part at the end that he said, where he said, I try everything I can to avoid needing to debug. So uh, this isn't like a software design class, but I want to basically quickly, before we touch on how to debug, first, how to avoid debugging. Um, there's many ways to properly write code to avoid debugging and kind of code defensively. Uh, but generally, the way that you can avoid debugging is just by testing your code often. Every small piece of functionality that you implement, make sure you test it before you move on to the next one. So test often. Don't, don't just write like 100 lines of code and then pray while you hit the run button and just see if it does what you want. Make sure that you incrementally, you know, whenever you're trying to solve a problem, 
every step along the way, just make sure your outputs are looking right. Make sure your code is compiling. Make sure that it's doing what you want it to do. Uh, so with that said, how can we make debugging a little bit less painful? Well, in general, problems usually boil down to incorrect assumptions that you have inside of your head about what your code does. That is really usually the reason why you have a lot of problems in your code. If you have a bunch of these incorrect assumptions, you'll end up you know, programming something up and then realizing that a bunch of things don't do what you thought it did. And so the way that you want to debug your code is by proving to yourself that certain things work. And the, in the incorrect assumptions that you had, you can solve by doing some of the things that we are going to talk about today. So there is no just straightforward algorithm to debugging any problem. It's not like a certain set of uh, steps that you can take and you'll always be able to solve any issue that you're having with debugging. But what we can offer you is like a toolbox, a little bit of a framework to tackle these issues that you might have. So here is a toolbox of tips and tricks that you can use when they're appropriate. So first things first, super simple version of debugging. This is called print line debugging. Super simple. How do you print line debug? You just put print lines all over your code to measure outputs. And so print line debugging, despite it being quite simple, is actually quite powerful. Uh, I know some people that like have never done anything except for print line debugging, and they've been coding for like many years. Uh, it's quite powerful. So, what kind of what kind of questions can you answer with print line debugging? Well, you can use these print lines to answer questions like, "Well, am I even entering this function? Uh, why is this value null here? How many elements are in my array at this point in time?" You can put print lines to see, well, if I am, you know, if I put a print line inside of an if statement and it's never executed, well, then we know that we're never entering that if statement. Uh, if I'm wondering why a certain value is null, you know, I can print out that element and see what's going on. If, I want, if I'm adding and removing things from an array and I just want to see you know, how things are moving in and out, I can put in some print lines, see my outputs, and just kind of see what's going on. So let's just quickly demo this. So uh, here I have actually a, um, a homework problem from, I believe this was homework one for Python. And I found some bugs that you guys made in your previous submissions on your code. Uh, and so I figured it would be a good little exercise to you know, show how we would go about debugging that in uh, using these techniques that we're talking about today. So print line debugging, uh, this is the Fizbos problem. If you don't remember it, basically we just gave you a number and you would iterate all the way up until you reach that number. And for each number, if it's, a, uh, if it's divisible by three, you, you output fizz into a list. If it's divisible by five, you output buzz into a list. If it's divisible by 15, or uh, if it's divisible by both three and five, then you output fizz buzz. And if it's none, then it's neither of those. Um, so this is some code that we have uh, that I saw in one one of our students' submissions. And so down here, I have the correct outputs for what these function calls should be returning. And so if I run this code here, you'll see that it's it's not returning that, right? My code is incorrect here. And so instead of returning fizzbuzz, neither, neither in fizz, I'm returning what you see here. So we know something's wrong with our code. We're testing it, and we see that the outputs are not what we thought they were. And so you know, if you're just looking at the code and staring at it and hoping to find the problem, this isn't really always very good, because the problems might not stick out to you right away. So what can you do? Well, a good idea is to use print lines to see what's going on. So what's going on here? We're never actually outputting fizzbuzz. We're, this is never happening. Right? We're, we're only putting in fizz, neither, and buzz into our output list. So you know, if we want to go through this code and see where we can properly put in some print lines, well, let's see a good example of where we could place a print line. So I'm noticing that uh, I'm never outputting fizz buzz into the list. So you know, if I want, I could put a print line here and just see, well, ever, am I ever entering this if statement? So I could literally just write, you know, like, hello, <laughs> is, this, is this going on here, right? Am I am I entering this this conditional? So fizzbuzz, and we'll see that we it's not printing out anything. And I can put one of these in all of these conditionals, just see what's going on. So we could just say by three, 
right? We don't have to be very clean about these print lines, usually. By five, and let's just see what's going on here. Okay, so we are, we are going into the first two conditionals. We know that's happening. So let's actually just see for what values am I entering these conditionals for. So let's let me just print out num, and I'll just say, you know, inside of three, and let me just output this and just see what's going on. So we can see that when we're inside of the, the conditional for divisible by three, we can see that our number, the value of num, is zero, which according to the problem statement should not have been the case, right? Um, if you remember the problem statement, uh, I believe we said that zero should be fizzbuzz, right? So once we have actually looked at what's going on here, we can notice that, well, we should, move this conditional that we have down here all the way up top because we're never reaching this, right? We're never entering this conditional. We never printed anything out when we had that. So if I just move this back up, we'll notice that this will actually work. And we realize that it was never being reached because of that print line. We never actually printed anything. And so here we have our the, the correct output of this function. Uh, print line debugging is very simple. You just put print lines everywhere. See if you're entering certain things. See what the value of certain things are. And just adjust accordingly. Uh, what are the cons of print line debugging? Well, for one, they're a bit slow. Uh, why are they a bit slow? Well, if you noticed, I had to recompile my code every single time and relaunch my application every single time I added in a new print line. So, you know, the, the activity of doing print line debugging is a bit, you know, involved. It's a bit slow. Uh, another thing is that they are literally a part of your code, right? Uh, adding print line statements can change around line numbers. It can cause Git, if you're using version control, to pick up, you know, weird modifications that you didn't actually create to the source code. Uh, it can even affect performance and behavior because printing things out does cost time, computational time. And in general, it can get very messy. If you noticed what I did there, I put a bunch of print lines everywhere and it kind of messied up the code a bit. And finally, they're a little bit limited. Uh, we're gonna go over some things later on in the lecture that kind of demonstrate how you can go even further than print line debugging to accomplish things more than just you know looking at the certain value of things at some spots. So uh, let's talk about next rubber duck debugging. So some of you guys might laugh at this, right? But rubber duck debugging is actually quite powerful. And it's likely the most powerful debugging technique that you already know how to do. Um, so what is rubber duck debugging? Well, the name is a reference to a story in the book, The, Programmic, uh, the Pragmatic Programmer, in which a programmer would literally carry around a rubber duck and debug their code by forcing themselves to explain it line by line to the duck. And so many of you guys have already accomplished this kind of, uh, you know, debugging technique, even if you are new to programming. Like, this is something that I have been a victim of many times myself, like, when I was younger. Uh, when I talk about rubber duck debugging, I always tell the story of how, like, you go into the kitchen and you open up the fridge and you're looking for, like, you know, a bottle of ketchup or something. And you're just looking all over the fridge. You, and then you just can't find it. Then eventually you bring over your mom or your dad and you're like, mom or dad, you know, I opened up the fridge, I looked through every single shelf, I couldn't find it, I was looking behind certain, th you know, I looked behind everything and then, oh, oh, sorry, mom, it's actually right there. <laughs> and then, you know, you, you, you've distracted your mom, she was probably watching TV, comfortable, you brought her out all the way to the kitchen and you realized that just because you were explaining like line by line your thought process. So here are some rubber ducks. Um, so from Wikipedia, many programmers have had the experience of explaining a problem to someone else, possibly even someone that knows nothing about programming, and then hitting upon the solution in the process of explaining the problem. In describing what the code is supposed to do and observing what it actually does, any incongruity between the two becomes apparent. More generally, teaching a subject forces its evaluation from different perspectives and can provide a deeper understanding. 
by using an inanimate object, the programmer can try to accomplish this without having to interrupt anyone else. So the idea here is you use a rubber duck so you don't have to bug someone else. You don't need any response from the person that you're explaining it to because it's just you'll eventually have the realization in the process of explaining what's going on. So how do you do rubber duck debugging? Well, you grab first a rubber duck or any other inanimate object. Obviously, it doesn't have to be a rubber duck. It could also be an animate object, but the person that you ask will likely be a little bit annoyed. Uh, just anything that will listen to you. Go line by line and explain what you're doing with a lot of detail. Be very detailed. The rubber duck will love hearing all of the detail that you give it. And then finally, you will have that aha moment where you find the bottle of ketchup and you, <laughs> you're like, oh, it's actually right there. I'm sorry. And you find you're probably, it's a probably a stupid mistake or an obvious mistake. And so then you put your rubber duck away and, or apologize to the friend that you asked for help. So demo, let's do a demo of rubber duck debugging. Um, so let me actually, I don't have a rubber duck, but hold on. I've got I've got this thing that I got at a hackathon, so th this will be my rubber duck. It doesn't have to be uh, doesn't have to be a rubber duck. It just has to be any inanimate object. So here we go. Here's my rubber duck. Uh, so you just so let's go ahead and actually have the same issue that we had before. You guys already know the solution to this by now. But let's go ahead and say we have the same exact issue. Uh, I would just basically go through this line by line, starting from the top, and I would just say like. Well, you know, rubber duck, in this problem, I'm trying to output all of the fizzbuzz for every single number that I, that I iterate through. So I'm going to iterate starting from 0 all the way to the length of the number that I'm given. And I'm going to run my fizzbuzz function on every single element. And I'm going to output the, the response into the list. So in my fizzbuzz function, I'm taking in a number. And I'm checking if that number is divisible by 3. If that's the case, I'm going to return fuzz, uh, fizz. Then I'm going to check if the number is divisible by 5. If that's the case, I'm going to output buzz. And then finally, if, I, if the number is, an, is uh, divisible by 3 and 5, then I'm going to return fizz buzz. And then, oh, I realized, well, actually, I'll never get to this point because the previous two conditionals are the exact same. So that is just basically the idea of rubber duck debugging. Um, now, just to have a little bit of fun, actually, uh, I want to do some rubber duck debugging with someone from the audience. Um, I think we can do this. I can, I can uh, ask for some volunteers, one volunteer, that's all I need. We'll actually offer 1% extra credit for doing this because I know it's probably really scary. Uh, I'm going to bring one of you guys into a Discord channel and do some rubber duck debugging. So let's see. Let's see. Who is who is a brave soul? Who is willing to do? Who is willing to join me on stream? Okay, I'm gonna go with the first person, uh, Sanjavi Two. Go ahead and join. Go ahead and join the office hour room number one. <laughs> okay. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, and those of you on the stream, can you hear him? Uh, keep talking so we can just make sure they can hear you. Yeah, what's up? All right, yeah, so they can hear you. Welcome to the welcome to the channel. Um, so I'm sure you can see the problem on the screen here. And so what I want you to do is rubber duck debug it live for us on stream. And so actually, we'll do this problem. This is the problem that I wanted to do rubber duck debugging for. So this is, this problem is basically we want to remove consecutive vowels from, uh, from the input string that we're given, and basically, so I'll show you an example of what it's supposed to output. So right here, the string is Rohan. How are you, man? <laughs> And basically, we want to go through, and all of these consecutive vowels, we only want to keep one. So this is the proper output right here. We want to remove all consecutive vowels. And so the, the output that we're currently having is down here. So 
go ahead and have at it. Just describe me what's going on here line by line, and let me see if you can get the problem. I'm going to be your rubber duck. Okay, so um, in the very beginning, obviously, or, uh, wait, so it's the remove vowels? Um, yeah, we're calling right? remove vowels. Right. We're calling remove okay. vowels. Okay, yeah. so um, what's happening is that you're um, printing a uh, the first uh, letter of the string, and then um, for uh, each uh, for each uh, index in the string, um, let's see, for each index in the string, uh, you're basically cycling through it um, from index one to the length of the string, um, and then if the vowel is vowel is uh, one less, uh, if the sorry if um, you call is vowel, which is a function that uh, returns if the character is um, a vowel. So if it's equal to A, I, E, O, or U, and it compares it, and then it returns um, true or false. Um, and you say, uh, is vowel um, string um, I minus 1, which is basically saying that the index um, minus 1, so you're comparing it to the previous index. Um, and you're comparing to see if uh, it's not e it's not true, and um, you're also comparing to see if it's so basically you're comparing the previous index with the current index, um, and you're saying if the previous index is not a vowel and the uh, the current index is not a vowel, then um, print this print the uh, letter. So mm -hmm. basically, what this is trying to do is uh, figure out if the string is going to be um, if the string is like basically not uh, the same or no, not vowels, then it's going to print out um, the same thing. Or it's going to print out the uh, the letter. Um, I think the issue that we have here is that uh, nowhere does it check if... Um, nowhere does it check if they're the same vowel. Um, so I'm going to kick back out of rubber duck mode and kick into uh, instructor mode. So... Uh, there's. I, I want to make it clear. Actually, we're not adding or removing. Like we're not adding anything to this code. Like the solution okay. isn't adding anything to this code. There's something in here. It's just reordering. There's something in here that's just like a very small detail that's just wrong, and just changing it will fix the whole problem. It's a very small issue. If you uh, if you want to take like another one minute of just like running through it, and then if you can't get it, that's completely fine. Um, is it the semicolon? Uh, do I have a semicolon in here? Oh. Uh, there's yeah, semicolon that, that's not the problem. But yeah, okay, good catch. Just, uh, okay. Um, I will actually say that some people have found the answer in the uh, Twitch chat. Which hopefully you rubber ducking it for them help them find the issue. Okay. Um, I think it is that. Don't you have to like you have to check like like isn't it not checking if both of them are vowels? Okay. So right here in this conditional, basically we are checking if the previous one is not a vowel, right? Mm -hmm. And if the current one is not a vowel. But instead of that, we want to be able to say the issue is with the and, basically. Because both of them, like, we only want one or the other, right? We only want if the previous one is not a vowel or if the current one is not a vowel. Does that make sense? Yeah, because if both of them are vowel, if, if both of them are not vowels, then it's not going to... Uh... One of them has to be a vowel. Exactly. Right? One of the it's a con yeah. To find the consecutive vowel, only one of them needs to be there. So yeah. Uh yeah. If I just switch this to or, then we will then we will have the correct output here. That was a tough problem. Kudos to you for coming into the stream. So, uh, you'll get extra credit for this. Uh, just make Thank sure you. I can keep track of your net ID. All right. <laughs> sure. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. All right. Well, that was fun. Um, 
I hope that helped you guys understand like just what rubber duck debugging looks like and, and how it helps finding uh, issues. So that was actually a pretty tough problem. I'm not going to lie. Uh, that, was not, that was not an easy problem. Um, are people talking about something in the chat here? Wrong answer? It's not a wrong answer. That is the right answer. That is the correct output. OK, let's continue. So uh, we went over two, two, two tips and tricks for debugging. We talked about print line debugging, which is very powerful. And then we also talked about uh, rubber duck debugging. So now I want to talk about debuggers. So debuggers allow you to set breakpoints throughout your code and automatically trace throughout it. So I think I just should just show you guys what a debugger looks like straight up, straight away. So basically, let's go ahead and go through uh, just how a debugger looks like. So basically, uh, it depends on what IDE or text editor you're using. So I'm not going to show you guys how to set up a debugger. Just look up how to set up a debugger in whatever IDE or text editor that you guys use. But basically, all of them are the exact same. You're able to set what are called breakpoints. And so what breakpoints are, are basically you put them on a line that has code on it, not a line that doesn't have code on it. So in this case, we can put it on like a line right here. The red dot is a breakpoint. And what breakpoints mean is that we want to run our code like usual, but once we hit one of these breakpoints, stop. So let me just show you guys that. So we will run the program here. So the program was run just like usual. But once we got to the line that we put a breakpoint on, we stop. And so from here, I am going to control the flow of the program from this point onwards. And so the way that we can control the flow of the program from this point onwards is by using these little controls here. And so we'll go over that in just one second. But another thing that I want to note is that you're able to see the state of the variables right on the side here. I hope you guys are able to see that. I can zoom in a bit. Ooh, I think that should be good. So you're able to see the state of the variables on the side here. So we can see that num is currently 5, which makes sense because that's the first element of the array. Sum is currently 0, which makes sense because we initialized it to 0. And if I want to continue going forward from this point on, I can use these controls. So this red button is how you stop it. And by the way, all debuggers are like almost identical. So this is just specific to the current debugger that I'm using here. We can use green to restart the entire uh, program. We can use play to just you know, continue onwards as if the program is normally running. So uh, we can continue that way. And then this button right here, step over, is the important one. This allows us to step line by line through our code. So we set the breakpoint here. And if I want to go through my code from this point on, line by line, I can just click step over. And we'll see that we're going to go through this loop line by line. And on the side here, you can see our variables updating. You can see num going into 2, because now we're at this point in the array. You can see sum going to 12. And basically, it's a nice way of kind of avoiding using print lines. Um, you can see the state of your variables just by using the debugger, and you can do a bit more complicated things. So this is just the very basics of how to use a debugger. You can set multiple ones of these breakpoints, and uh, you're, ab you're able to see the state of your, of your variables. Now, if you guys noticed, there were, some more, there were some more buttons on that control that we uh, that control menu that we had open when we ran the debugger. So let me go ahead and show you guys what those are. So here is some code. It's not broken or anything. I just want to show you how to control the flow of things using this control panel. So we went over, you know, stop, stopping the whole debugger, restarting the debugger, continuing. But these three buttons here are actually how you move through your code. And they all do things that are a bit different. So we talked about how step over is stepping through our code line by line. So that will do the exact same thing here. If I have my breakpoint here, I'll step over my code line by line. So after t, I'll go straight to return t, and then my program is over, right? 
Now, what are these other two buttons? Well, these other two buttons are a bit different. This button right here, as you can see, is step into. And so step into is how you step into functions. So what does that mean? Well, if you remember, with step over, we said it's line by line. So if I were to click step over from this point in time, my control would go to this line. However, if I do step into, what will happen is that it will go into this function call here, foo. So if I click step into, we will now step into that function call. And we'll see that it returns high. And so t is equal to the input to this function and the return of foo. So if I uh, continue step over, we'll see that now uh, t is going to be high, high. So now let's go ahead and go through the last uh, control that we have here, which is step out. So step out is how you step out of functions. And so if I click this step out button, basically what it will do is get out of this function by just executing the rest. So if I click step out, we'll see that I go all the way over here. Why? Because when I clicked step out here, it just basically executed the rest of the function and stepped out of the function call. So those are the three controls. Step over, I would say, is probably the most common one that you'll use. So that way you can step through your code line by line by line. So let's go ahead and show an example of how we can use the debugger to debug our code. So this is some broken code from uh, one of the submissions on the homework about substring counts. I hope that you guys uh, know what the problem is asking for, since I'm assuming all of you have done it by now. Uh, but basically, we are returning the maximum, uh, the, the substring that, that occurs the most in the input string that we are given, substrings of size 2. And so this is some code that doesn't work. I can go ahead and actually run it, and you will see that the outputs are not correct. So sub str. So here are our outputs. We're getting none, 2, 3, and w3. This is incorrect. We should be getting 12, 3, and ws4, just like we have here. So our code does not work. We can establish that. Um, so how can we go about tackling this? Like, we can do rubber duck debugging. We can do print line debugging. Uh, all of them are very you know, valid ways of going about debugging this. But if you wanted to use the debugger for this, well, we can just set breakpoints along our code to just see what's going on in our program. So let's say, you know, if I was debugging this and I wanted to use print line debugging, I'd probably put a print line like right here, substring, to see what my substring is. Am I getting the right substring or not? Um, let me actually, after I, uh, after the, the function, can I actually just print out substring counts? Let me see if I'm building my dictionary properly. Is that going on correctly? Uh, I can print out something like, uh, let's see, am I, you know, am I entering, uh, am I entering this conditional down here? Let's let's take a look. So I'll go ahead and run this, and so I'll show you guys the debugger after we go through this. So. You know, we do a print line, you know, and we'll notice that our our substring dictionary is actually incorrect because in this dictionary we want to be storing the substrings. And for some reason, our substrings are all of length one. They should be of length two. So what's going on there? Uh, we are entering the if statement, so that that's completely fine. Uh, but you know, we can also do similar things with the debugger. So Let's say I go ahead and just set a breakpoint right here because I want to see what my substring is at every single iteration. And uh, let's just go ahead and run that. So we run it. And OK, so we ran the pro program like usual. But because we have the breakpoint there, we say run it. But here we want to stop. And I want to control the flow of this program beyond this point. So if we look over here on the side, we can see the current state of all, all of our variables. We can see that uh, substring counts is empty. Our input string is this. Um, we can see that all, all of this is empty, right? So let's, let's step through our code. So as we go through, we can see that substring is actually 0. 
Well, if we look at the input string, we know that substring should actually be 0, 1, right? Because we want substrings of size 2. So now we can actually look at this and we can notice that our string slice is incorrect. So if I were to put 2 here, then uh, that'll likely solve our issue. And I can actually just restart it and uh, see if that solves our problem. So now, now that we've restarted and we've increased the bounds of our substring by one, okay, our substrings are now correct. Well, now I'm curious. Let's see. If I run this code normally, will I have the proper outputs? Let's take a look. Substring. So uh, we actually do not have the proper outputs. Everything is off by one. 12.2 instead of 12.3, WS instead of WS4. Uh, so we're off by one here. So if we t take a look at the code here again, uh, there's many ways we can tackle these issues, right? We can use the debugger, check out the current state of our variables. Maybe in this case, I just want to do rubber duck debugging. I go through line by line. So I'm looping through my input string and I'm getting the substrings of every single um, you know, substrings of size two of the string. And again, when I talked about incorrect assumptions in your code, we are not making an incorrect assumption here. Actually, we know that this substring is correct because we checked the outputs. So this should be totally fine. Uh, we ch we're checking if the substring is in substring counts. If it is, we'll increment by one. Otherwise, we will set it to zero. And then, oh, we found the issue, right? Here, we actually want to say initialize it to 1 because we found it for the first time. And so now, if I just run this again, we'll find that we have our correct output. So, you know, we can use these different debugging techniques to see the current state of our variables, see if we're entering certain things, checking our logic, checking our assumptions, and you'll be able to find a lot of the bugs in your code. So I hope that's a nice little tutorial on how to use uh, debuggers. Pick whatever strategy makes sense to you. Sometimes print line debugging is all you really need. You know, running a debugger is like running a full body scan on a patient. You don't always need a debugger. Sometimes it's a bit too much. Uh, sometimes, especially in larger programs, you might want a debugger because things can get a bit crazy. You know, like finding the current state of certain variables might not always be super easy. Uh, print lines are always great, and rubber duck debugging is also something that you should definitely try out when you're extremely stumped on why your code is not working. So someone says, after getting the breakpoint, how do you get the debugger window? Because usually, don't you run the program normally in the terminal? So like I said, I'm using VS Code. Uh, the debugger is built into VS Code. If you're using like IntelliJ or you're using Sublime Text or you're using whatever text editor IDE that you use, just look up how to use the debugger in your you know, piece of software and you'll find something. Um, I don't wanna show how to set up a debugger because it might not you know, affect everyone and also uh, it's not the greatest use of time. So for me, I get the debugger window basically by hitting this play button right here. I set breakpoints and then I hit play and it'll run my program as usual, and once it gets to that point, it'll stop. So that's how I get my debugger window. Um, and that's how it is in VS Code. All right, so let's talk about Professor Google. So uh, sometimes, you know, the strategies that I told you guys won't work. Sometimes you'll get a weird error message. Sometimes you'll get, you know, an issue that just does not make any sense to you. And no matter how many print lines, no matter how many times you use the debugger, or no matter how many times you run through it out loud with a great detail, it just makes no sense. So this is where Professor Google comes into play. Google, use Google. Please use Google. Uh, Google will help you become self-sufficient immediately. All of your answers are there, basically, right? Take your error message, drop it into Google. Describe what you think your problem is and drop it into Google. Use Google. Google is amazing. So how are we going to demo this? We're going to do a nice little fun Google scavenger hunt on Kahoot. Uh, I have a certain set of questions. We'll see how many we can get through. Uh, basically, I'll throw up the question on Kahoot. And uh, you guys will have about like uh, two minutes to answer every single question. Keep in mind the delay. Uh, you shouldn't need much more than like 50 seconds, though, to answer questions. So I'm going to give you guys about like two minutes to join in. Let me know if you guys have any questions 
in the chat. Two minutes is too long. I will see. Uh, I will. I'm not. I'm not afraid to cut it off if uh, if I notice that most people have answered the question. I also, we did this like live in person before last time we did one of these, and uh, like I don't really know how to handle the delay. So, someone says, "How do you know which debugging debugging method to use? Is there a specific use case you you should use for each method?" Um, so I would say, like, most of the time you can just use print line debugging. And usually print line debugging is good for, like, not super large scale bugs, you know? Just very simple, like, check if you're inputting, entering this function. Check what your, the value of something is at this point. If you're finding yourself, actually, I'm going to go ahead and get this Kahoot started. If you're finding yourself putting, like, 20 print lines in your code, that's where it's probably better to just use a debugger, right? Okay, so first question. Git is yelling at me. It says, error, unable to read tree object head. What does that even mean? What am I supposed to do? I can move my camera. I was prepared for this. Uh, how do I solve this problem? What's going on? Git is just yelling at me. So Google is at your fingertips. Go ahead, <laughs> fire away. Your answer is there. So this is just a nice little exercise for you guys to get used to Googling your errors, get used to Googling your problems. Uh, to continue answering that question, how do you know what debugging method to use? Uh, I, I think like the, the use cases are all, usually it'll come down to either print line debugging or, you know, if it's a larger scale problem, use a debugger. Or if you want more than just like the basic things that print line debugging gives you, use a debugger. Um, you're not always able to use a debugger in every environment that you have. So sometimes print line debugging is the only thing you have. Um, what else? I would say that rubber duck debugging is like something that you can do if you've tried the other two and you're just not finding the issue. Like, or maybe you found the issue, but you're not exactly sure how to solve it. Um, that's like the best way I could kind of put it. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and cut this off. Uh, we can Let's see how many questions we can get through. So this is the correct answer. Honestly, I couldn't really tell you a whole bunch about why it's the correct answer. I would personally just Google this and I would see what they have to say. I mean, like if I got this error, I personally wouldn't really know how to solve it. So that's where you use Google. You don't know what's going on, throw it in Google and see that's the answer. So if you were to Google it, you'd see that, you know, if you just throw this error message in there, Yo, I'm pretty sure the answer is like literally on the first Stack Overflow post. You'll just see that uh, here's a little description of what to do. Also, by the way, the first thing on a Stack Overflow post is the question. Scroll down to the answer right here. And so this is your answer. Um, let's continue. So when I type echo path, it returns my actual path. But I want to just echo the word. I want to echo the string. How can I echo these dollar signs? This is really annoying. How do I do this? Google is at your fingertips. Someone asked what the Kahoot code is. The Kahoot code is right down here. Even though we've entered it, you can always find it at the bottom of the screen. What do you do if there are no posts with your question? I think it is very rare to not be able to find a post with your question. 
like extremely, extremely rare. Most of the time, like any problem that you've had, someone else has had it. I don't think I've ever actually had a problem that didn't have a post about it somewhere. Uh, if you can't find a post, try to probably change your Google search around, you know, like be a bit more descriptive. Make sure you put keywords in your search. Like if you're searching about Python, put Python in your search. Uh, if you're searching about Git, put Git in your search, put the error message, things like this. Like most of the time your search is not right if you're not finding posts about the thing that you're having trouble with. Now, if you really, really aren't finding posts that have your question, I mean, I don't even know, like make a Stack Overflow post. I don't even know who makes Stack Overflow posts to be honest. Like, <laughs> I don't think I've ever met a person that made a Stack Overflow post, if I'm being honest. Because the answers are all there. <laughs> so, okay. Well done to the 71 of you. Um, if you were to Google the issue, you would see that you can echo dollar signs by using this escape character. Uh, so, well done. Let's continue going forward. My Python code that does this isn't working. Why is that? The compiler is yelling at me. I don't know what's going on. Please help me. I don't know what to do. I'm gonna I'm gonna close my laptop and I'm gonna run to office hours because it's not working. What's going on? Tell me what's going on. I hope you guys are enjoying your time. <laughs> hope you guys are all having a great time using Google. It's a great website. Great website. All right, I'm going to cut this off pretty soon. So get your answers in. You can do it. I believe in you. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna click the button. I'm gonna do it. I'm going. All right. So the correct answer is yellow. The eval function in Python must take in a string. So how do we know that? Well, we look up eval function Python, and then we'll find that it says. Python expressions are from a string-based input. Um, you can also just click on this post and we'll see that, you know, probably find some example code. Yep, we'll find that it takes in a string. And so the problem is here, there is no string. We're just inputting in numbers. So the compiler will yell at you. Uh, that is the issue. You have, to, you have to make this a string and it'll do, it, it'll, it'll do the eval function for you. Okay, I am blocking the question a little bit, but it'll show up. So here is my code. This is my code right here in the middle. And I'm getting unsupported operation, not readable whenever I try to run. What's going on here, guys? I don't know what the problem is. Uh, how do I fix this error? I'm uh, I'm a bit confused, guys. I'm I'm getting this error, and I just don't know what's going on. Unsupported operation. What does that mean? Is office hours still open? Can you help me? Do you know the answer? 
I wonder if he knows the answer. How you doing, man? I named him Andy. Does he get it? Because it's an android? Andy, you know? It's kind of funny. <clears throat> it's my guy right here. Love this guy. You gotta fill in the airtime, you know, in these long Kahoot questions. It's a lot of, you know. <clears throat> the music is so peaceful, I must say. Like, it's kind of like Minecraft music, you know? Have you guys ever uh, played my. Oh, whoa! <laughs> Woo! That was scary! <laughs> That's a little, that's a little scary. All right, <clears throat> well done to the <laughs> 72 of you. So what I would do here is I would just take this error and drop it into Google. And then I would say, uh, wow, there's a Stack Overflow post on it. And I would say, okay, well using W, you won't be able to read the file. Use the following instead, put an R in there. So that's our answer. Uh, here we were using W. W is how you write to a file in Python when you open it. and uh, R is how you read. So there's our answer. Final question. Uh, when I do my list.reverse at the end of the function, I'm just returning none. Why is that? Uh, what's going on here? I don't know why I'm returning none. Can someone help me out? Anyone want to help a brother out? I need some help. Anyone want to help me? <clears throat> so our last question, everyone. So our last question. Final question. Final countdown. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. It's kind of intense. <laughs> Someone says, why do I dance around while I'm streaming? Well, you see, I'm not dancing. Uh, I just drink coffee. And <laughs> uh, sometimes I'm uh, lightweight with caffeine. All right, and I also use a standing desk uh, when I'm lecturing. And so I get a little antsy sometimes, all right? I'm not dancing. Calling me out. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and cut this off, guys. Uh, so, oh, wow. All right, actually, that's fine. I had two answers to this question. I thought I thought <laughs> we had a problem here. This is very well done. Both of these are correct. I did this because uh, depending on what you Google, there are more than one answer. So this is actually an issue that we had a lot on the last homework. Uh, a lot of people were doing dot sort on lists in Python, and many people were just returning none. Uh, that's because uh, sort, dot sort, and dot reverse, in this case, they don't return anything. So um, you would just get none if you tried to assign it to a value or return it. So in order to actually return a value to get a new list that's reversed, you would use this function. Otherwise, <clears throat> this does not return a value. So both of these are correct. Well done. And uh, let's go back to the slides if I can find them. That is it for today's lecture. Uh, on Tuesday, you guys are free to go. Uh, on Tuesday, we are going to cover, I believe, uh, machine learning. That's going to be a fun one. Like I said, the next few lectures are going to be a random bag of topics up until our midterm presentations. And then once we finish that, we're going to be starting the Rust programming language to signify the second half of the semester. So some of these topics that we go through will be uh, useful for your projects. If you are using you know, these technologies in your projects, uh, we're going to knock out all these lectures. And then once we kind of knock out the things that might be useful to your projects, we're going to be starting the Rust programming language. It's going to be a lot of fun. 
many of you have probably never used Rust before. Uh, it'll be very new, very challenging, and very unique. So uh, I'll stick around for some questions. But uh, like I said, you guys are free to go. I hope today helped you guys out. Um, debugging is something that is very useful skill to have. And hopefully the tools and techniques that we went through today will help you guys debug your code and your issues.